You sound amazing. I sound ridiculous because I lost my voice, but I did not want to lose the opportunity well, you know to speak I don't with know what your voice sounds like normally, but it sounds perfectly fine to me. It just sounds sort of like Demi Moore kind of oh. raspy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll take it. If any part of me is like Demi Moore, I will take it. Oh, um, great. But we're here to talk about the 20th anniversary of, anniversary of Lemonade Days, which of course is part of Alex's Lemonade Stand foundation. Um, and it's an amazing organization that you've created. It You have raised $300 million. Is that right? That's right. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. And funded 1,500 research projects at 150 institutions across North America and Europe. Everybody knows Alex's Lemonade Stand. But of course, this must be a little bit of a bittersweet anniversary because it marks the anniversary also of Alex's death. So can you tell us a little bit about her? What kind of girl she was? What kind of person she was? Of course, I would love to. Um, she, honestly, she was in many ways just a typical kid, right? She um, she happened to be diagnosed with cancer before she turned one. And I think living with cancer for the rest of her life until she was eight and a half and fighting cancer all that time, undoubtedly, made her wiser and more aware of, of many things. Uh, I think one of those things that she became aware of was the fact that other kids like her were getting cancer and, and having a hard time getting cured. She had friends who passed away. I also think she had a maturity, you know, by, by four when she started her lemonade stand that's almost hard to understand if you didn't know her. But I guess other parents who have children with chronic illnesses or serious illnesses who deal with a lot in the first few years of life would probably say the same things about their kids. Our experiences in life strengthen us. They make us wiser. They, in many cases like Alex, they make us decide to fight not just for ourselves, but for other people, right? And in her case, I think she experienced everything so much so young that by the time she was four, she had the wisdom of a much older person. And, and I know her doctor would always say that it was more like treating a, a teenager or a young adult even. Um, well, but getting back to your question. She had to grow up that that fast. I mean, she didn't yes. have a childhood, a normal childhood. You know, it occurs yeah. to me, I hope you don't mind me asking, but how did you, what were her symptoms before she was diagnosed? She was... She was sick for a few months before she was diagnosed and her symptoms were um, very, she seemed uncomfortable, but for a nine month old, that meant crying and wanting to be held when she should be kind of wanting to play, especially with an a older brother who was a toddler also. Mm -hmm. She um, would get fevers up and down here and there. She had had a UTI that they treated with antibiotics. Um, she seemed, she was losing weight. All of these things that to me as a mom told me something was wrong, but unfortunately her, our family doctor at the time did not think there was anything wrong with her. And, and that's why her diagnosis was delayed by three months. Finally, we took her to the emergency room one weekend because we thought enough is enough. We've had her to the doctor multiple times every week. Something's not right. And that's when they admitted her and they said they, they thought she had something growing around her spine. So they did imaging of her, I guess, at that point? Yes, yes. So how do you explain to a child what's happening? I mean, she was just, she turned one two days after she was diagnosed. So for a child that age, it's not so much explaining as being there for them, holding them, holding their hand, um, you know, making sure that all their they're comfortable because it's hard for them to really verbalize, you know, what, what's going on, uh, making sure that everyone who came in the room took a moment to, which of course they did naturally to, you know, acknowledge that she was a baby and make her comfortable because when she was yeah. comfortable, uh, it was very easy to take care of her, but when she wasn't comfortable, she would cry and it would make it harder. So it was really in the moment as she got older, it becomes harder, right? Because 
they know more, they hear more. There's that balance between how much you tell them versus how much you don't tell them. And that is a very tricky line to walk. And I think, and I think also at the time, I mean, you and your husband, Jay, have done so much to forward the conversation, the national or international conversation around pediatric cancer and provide resources for parents and kids and, and medical professionals. But 20 years ago, I'm not sure that there was resources for parents to help you navigate the logistics of something like this and the emotional um, journey. So where did you and your husband go for support? We were fortunate to have, uh, we both have great family that was close by large families. So that was our first go-to. Um, at the time we were living in Connecticut. So we were going to Connecticut Children's Medical Center in Hartford. They had a child life person who was very helpful with our with our other son. They also, um, you know, we really relied on the medical team there. There was really no internet that to speak of, or that wasn't your first instinct to go online. That's for sure. Um, mm -hmm. We did, once we knew her diagnosis, we did find some journal articles, medical journal articles, uh, probably at the library and made copies of them and would read through them. But it was a very, yes, to your point, a very different world than it is now. Yeah. And you have certainly filled that void with the foundation. Um, I'm curious. So the story of Alex holding the first lemonade stand, there's a great video on your website. Um, if people want to go and watch that, it's really inspiring and really shows Alex, you know, at, at that age, in that moment of when she's doing all of that. From your point of view at the time, before the foundation was formed, you're her mom at that point. What are you thinking and feeling as you see her do this? Her first stand, honestly, I I thought it was kind of cute when she said she was going to have a lemonade stand and donate the money to her hospital so they could help kids like her. I was so proud of her. Keep in mind, this was 2000, right? This was 24 years ago. And kids were not doing lemonade stands for charity. I actually think that the notoriety Alex got brought that idea to children everywhere. And people do lemonade stands for all kinds of causes now, not just Alex's lemonade stand. But I think, I thought it was, I was so proud of her. I thought she was four, right? Like uh, it's hard to imagine when you see other four-year-olds, but Alex, as I mentioned, was very wise for a four-year-old. So it actually didn't surprise me that she had this idea. I mostly thought it was adorable, right? She, I, she's going to cure cancer with a lemonade stand. And I said, Alex, you're only going to raise five or $10. And she said, that's okay. I'll do it anyways. And, and really that's how it started with her just wanting to do something to help her doctors help kids like they had helped her. And I think that's a sense of gratitude that she had for the teams that took care of her. Um, I never could have imagined, first of all, that she'd raise $2,000 the first time. Never could have imagined that this would become an annual thing for her. Never could have imagined it would become a national, international news story. And then never could have imagined um, that it would continue now all these years later and that we would still be growing and, and having had the impact that we've had. Well, what are some of the milestones? So, so after your daughter died, um, you continued her work and you formed the foundation and you grew this organization. So what I have says that there have been 30,000 stands um, around the world and have raised 20.5 20 million dollars um, through kids and their families and their friends having these lemonade stands. But at what point in the beginning um, did you start seeing milestones within the organization that encouraged you to grow it more or think like, okay, we're really onto something? How did that, what was that path? So just a small thing, the lemonade, the, those are the lemonade days only numbers. So lemonade days was the event Alex created in June where people have lemonade stands all over the country originally to help her reach her million dollar goal. So that alone, we've had over 30,000 lemonade stands and raised over 20 million. Total, there's been close to 100,000 lemonade stands. Oh, wow. that have raised tens, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and I think that's an important distinction because People can have a lemonade stand anytime. Lemonade days is sort of our launch, 
right? It's like kind of how we kick off the summer and it's the event Alex created. Um, but those lemonade stands are happening all summer and even all year long. Um, so I, you know, I don't think we made a choice to continue the foundation to see what we could do. I don't know that at that point, you know, Alex had died a few months before. We were grieving. We had three sons who were also needed support. I don't think we were necessarily thinking this was going to be 20. We'd be sitting here 20 years later. We weren't thinking either or, right? I think the what happened was we were very lucky. People kept supporting. We were very fortunate. We had good advisors and people we knew who wanted to help and to continue helping. And we were able to just really grow pretty steadily over the years. Um, I would say the huge thing that happened. So Alex died in 2004. In 2005, we're just launching the foundation. First year without Alex. Really not sure how we're going to keep the attention and keep the momentum that she created going, keep this movement going. And there was a racehorse named a Fleet Alex. I don't know if you recall this. Uh, and Fleet Alex was locally owned by Philadelphia, a group of Philadelphia owners. Mm -hmm. And they had been donating through this racehorse anonymously. And now the horse was going to the Kentucky Derby. Very good horse, very good racing horse. Um, and they asked if it would be okay to go public. They thought it could bring awareness. We said, absolutely. What we didn't know was that a Fleet Alex's story, which he also had like a tough start to life and, and his breeder had cancer and Alex's story, my Alex's story would be so intertwined through that whole Triple Crown series and be featured prominently on NBC News. And yeah. it was a new level of awareness. And by the end of 2005, we had raised four million. So that was a huge, in, in 2004, Alex passed her goal. She raised a million and a half. 2005, now we jumped to four million, which is huge for a beginning organization. And that really created a moment, more momentum that we were able to continue with all of these new supporters and all of the new notoriety. Um, I would say the other big thing, or if you call it a milestone, but looking back, when you think of what success what, what made Alex's Lemonade Stand successful and move from the front yard. Honestly, and to this day, it's still a lot of our big um, national partners. So Volvo Cars was supporting her in the front yard. They took out ads to let people know what she was doing. They gave us money to start the foundation. They're still supporting us. Um, way back then, Rita's Water Ice came on board. Applebee's came on board. Um, Acme came on board. You know, these brands continued Alex's story, right? They became the sort of the early um, voice, the early face of Alex's lemonade stand to all of their customers and the people who were, who they were in contact with. And it really helped take Alex's lemonade stand as a foundation to many, many places that we could never have been. Um, well, did you, did, do you have a background? Do you or, or your husband have a background in running a nonprofit or anything like that? We didn't have a background in running a nonprofit. Um, and there's some very different things about running a nonprofit versus running a business, but but there's also a lot of similarities. So I would say maybe this was both a negative, but I think a positive for the most part. We ran it like a business. We had owned a coffee shop before when Alex was diagnosed. We had opened like the first, it was called a gourmet coffee shop, cappuccino espresso on the University of Connecticut after we graduated. And there was no, you know, a Starbucks on the East Coast. It was 1993. And um, it was a big success. And we actually sold it because we just couldn't, it was growing and we couldn't manage it anymore with Alex being so sick. Um, so we were comfortable with the idea of having a business. You know, my husband had also run like a pretty big painting business in college that he started. So we were comfortable with that, with the different aspects of the marketing and the budgeting and understanding, you know, how to spend to make sure you're still making enough money with nonprofit though. There's so many other things. That's why I said we had great advisors. Um, yeah. And the scale of this is huge. I mean, it didn't start out huge. It grew, but it grew right. pretty fast. Looking back, um, are there any things that you would do differently? Like, you know, business-wise or anything that oh, you gosh. learned that was like, you know, we're, business teaches you lessons every single day. Life teaches you lessons yeah. every single day. 
I mean, I think, I think sometimes the trick to it is like recognizing what you can learn from a mistake correct. and moving forward so you don't make that mistake again um, and not letting that mistake defeat you, but moving forward. So can you think of any examples like that? I would say, you know, it's hard to say mistakes, like you said, because everything teaches you so much. Yeah. I would say the thing that for me personally, I'm going to say that I had to learn was, um, I'm going to say to fine tune my people skills. So I think, um, I love everybody. I'm a trust, I'm a trusting person. And at the same time, you know, no, I'm so, we're so passionate. Right. And it was so new with Alex dying. And I think, you know, what I learned over the years was how to recognize great people and make sure that you connect with them and that you appreciate them. And then, you know, how to recognize maybe when, when someone is not clearly here to support the mission, right? If there's an ulterior motive and, and, and that's okay. People support charities for all different purposes, but, um, you know, we're so much about changing things for kids with cancer and we want to surround ourselves and we've been able to, we're so fortunate. And there's a lot of people out there who want to help with companies and supporters and employees and board members who know that that's at the forefront of everything we do. Yeah, and I think that you're known for that. You and your husband are known for being great leaders of a great organization. But as you say, it takes a lot of time to develop these partnerships. You have a large staff now to execute all of this stuff. Yes. And you're dealing with a difficult subject matter that touches people in a very specific way. And you're also liaison with the medical community. And that is very detailed information that some of the people on your staff have to master. Um, yes, so, so there are, yeah, I mean, it's a difficult thing. Um, I always say that I, I've been a journalist for a long time. I don't have a problem with the journalist part that I know how to do, but running Mainline Tonight, the business has Correct. been a learning curve for me. So as you're saying, like identifying totally the agree. right people who are like, he with you for the, you know, what is their role going to be? How the, can they contribute? And then how to navigate that if that's not coming to fruition or maybe they need Correct. some more support. That's it's the hard part. All those things, learning that sometimes it's about having, it's not, it's not that it's not the right person. Maybe they're in the wrong role and helping, yes. you know, coaching people. But I have to say, I've learned about myself. That does not come naturally to me. So that's what's that's where, if I'm going to say I made mistakes, which I hate to use that word, but where I learned the most and grew the most, I would say is in the people navigating, managing people, um, the nuances of dealing with people all the time. And, and, and I've come full circle because I truly believe, despite what sometimes it feels like out in the world, that most people are really genuinely good people. And at their core, they do want to help. And at the end of the day, most of us really want the same things out of life, right? Yeah. We may get there differently. Well, if you don't mind me asking you if I could just drill down a little bit on how you learned these skills, because one thing I say, as I just said, I knew the journalism part, mm -hmm. but I wasn't about to go get my MBA. I was already you know, running this business. So like, I'm not, maybe I should have, you know, got get, taken some business classes, but I say I got my podcast MBA because I started listening to podcasts about management and entrepreneurialism. And I have people around me who are entrepreneurs and I take them to lunch or dinner. I'm like, here's five things I'm struggling with. Can you educate me about this? So that's been my curve. What resources or how did you um, get these people skills or educate yourself about some strategies about that? I did you know, I, I, can't, I went through a reading phase, right? Where I'm like you, I thought, would an MBA help me? And then I thought, gosh, I don't know if I have time for that. So I would read, I can't even remember, but I read a number of books. Um, and then I did also go through like the podcast phase of listening to podcasts. I'm a fan of TED Talks. Um, more recently, and I hope it means I'm evolving. I think I've just learned a lot from, you know, 
20 years now of running the organization, I know the people that I can go to yeah. and say, hey, you know, let me bounce this off of you. And, and that's particularly helpful, I find, around managing around managing people. Um, where things come up all the time. People have lives and, and there's yeah. there's and there's also always... I think a lot of us have the same problems with yes. you know, I mean, we are each individual human beings, but there are a lot of commonalities in human behavior that somebody, the leader of a different organization could be like, oh yeah, I've had employees do that too. Absolutely. I'm fortunate to know um, a number of people who are have run bigger organizations or um, currently running big organizations or who have like run HR programs yeah. in different places, different types of businesses. And I find them really helpful if I have a very specific thing, sort of like, what? how would you handle this? Mm -hmm. um but you know i'm here for you melissa if you ever have i'm serious i, I oh i will totally I take that up on you every single day so I, yeah oh my gosh thank you for being so generous with your time i will take you up on that because i'm definitely learning and um I mean, and i let can me learn from you. you too so oh, you, know, you may so. get a text saying hey you know i have a quick question for you <laughs> do you oh, have any time i can be of help <laughs> I'm happy to be of help, but let me ask right now, like what advice would you give either to other leaders of nonprofits or to women who are in the nonprofit world or in business world? Because I think it is a little bit different for us women, um, especially, you know, if we're attached to something that has our name on it or our family's name on it, or in your case, your daughter's name on it. Yes. Um, one thing I just learned yesterday from somebody was to only make a certain number of decisions every day and to know and like, I'm too tired yeah. to make a decision or I've made too many decisions today. Let me think about this and I'll make that decision tomorrow or the next day. Are there any kind of nuggets that you can share with us about that? Well, I love that one for sure. Somebody um, also is going to tell me after this, don't do a video interview when you don't have a voice. <laughs> <laughs> I think you sound great. So, I mean, as far as a woman leading, let's just say, regardless of what you're leading. I mean, it seems cliche, but I do believe that you need to understand your strengths and don't be afraid to use them. Right. And, and people may say women should speak up more in boardrooms or women should do this. I think you should do what you think is the way that you are most comfortable leading. Having said that, also go outside your comfort zone, right? And that's where mm -hmm. I've had to push myself to say, well, this is the way I usually would react or this is how I would usually yeah. contribute. How can I do better by maybe changing my approach, right? So it's kind of knowing who you are, but also being open to understanding where you need to develop your strengths. And that I think has been the game changer for me over the past. Well, what I hear you saying is not being afraid to fail at something new Correct. because a lot of us stay in our comfort zones, but there might be some other way that just with a little tweaking, we can serve our business or our community. If we're not afraid to step outside of our, the box and, and maybe fail and then tweak and then fail and then, you know, make some changes. Is that kind of, Yes, yeah, I would say to put it really concisely, which is what I should have said in the first place, our very first board chair, the late Jeremy Nowak, who um, started and ran the reinvestment fund. We were so fortunate. He was our first board chair. He was like a neighbor. So I had no idea how lucky we were that he was willing to chair our board for, uh, for several years. He once said to me over a conversation, kind of an advising conversation, asking him some questions and things we were dealing with um, at the time, who knows what they were. And he said, he looked straight at me, you know, my husband and myself. And he said to me, don't be afraid to lead. And I knew he had hit exactly where I was at that moment and being afraid to co-lead. Yeah. Co-lead with my husband, which is a whole nother, you know, that's a whole nother conversation. But, um, that really helped me because I think about that oftentimes when you question maybe a decision, you question yourself, but you really believe like this is the right thing or this is the right way to go. Don't mm -hmm. be afraid to lead. Yeah. And I think a lot of us, 
and it's not just women, but it feels like sometimes it's just women that our leadership uh, styles maybe get criticized in a way that men don't. Um, it feels like that to me. I don't know if that's everybody's experience, but sometimes I'm really sure about something. And if I say it in a certain way, nobody accepts it. So I've had to change how I say things sometimes. And somebody, one of my mentors said to me, it's not your message. It's the messenger. <laughs> so Jane, you're, you're right. You're not wrong. The way you're saying it is wrong. So think about what is your ultimate goal in getting this thing accomplished, whatever you're trying to get accomplished. And what is the way that you can say it in a way that people will follow you as a leader? So I yes, really, that, that was like true. one of those light bulb moments when I thought, oh, okay. Well, and I think everyone, another thing I've learned is everyone, not everyone, most people respond to thoughtful leadership. And that's, I think, what I was trying to get at the core of when I said things I learned and would do differently. When we were grieving and we were new at this, I was much more likely to just make a decision or react to something maybe out of emotion more than thoughtfulness. Now I can say, you know, let me think about this or, hmm, you know, not, not sure. And I'm comfortable saying that. And I think that's really important. I think people respect that in many ways yeah. more, right? When you when yeah. they know that you're giving something thought. Oh, believe me, it's not my nature. So it's very hard for me to do, but I'm getting better at it. Right now, that's my current um, growth. Goal. It sounds, I mean, this is all great stuff. And I, I, so as you're celebrating the 20th anniversary of this, tell me about what's going on, what's going to be going on this summer. How are you honoring this anniversary? So the biggest way is it's the 20th anniversary of Lemonade Days. As we mentioned, Alex created that in 2004. She wanted to raise a million dollars before she died. And she said, if we have lemonade stands in every state, if everyone has lemonade stands, we can do it. And she did reach her goal. And we've continued that year after year with a goal of raising a million dollars. We are much closer to over 2 million now through Lemonade Days. Um, and the idea is that everyone can get involved and have a lemonade stand there's no cost to sign up. There's no minimum you have to raise. We send you a little starter kit and it's a truly great way to be a part of something that's making a huge difference. Um, I would say personally, you know, reflecting on Alex's 20 years since she passed has, um, you know, given me a lot to celebrate, I think, in terms of what we've accomplished, but also has been a, a point for me. And, and I would say the foundation where we're saying, okay, well, you know, we've come this far, but look where we still have to go and how are we going to get there? So I, I would say it's less a celebration and more a reflection. Well, that's a great way to put it. Um, and I have followed your journey. I've been to many lemonade stands um, I've followed your journey and it, it's just remarkable what you've done, the way that you've done Thank it you. and the team that you have around you to do it. And the work that you're doing is so important, but the way that you are doing that work is just completely awesome. So I'm so glad, um, to have the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you so much for making it the time. Thank you for sharing your memories with Alex and thank you for doing the work that you do. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Very much.